This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. Turkey deployed more tanks to its borders with Iraq in a military buildup amid speculation that it may launch an attack against the Turkish Kurdistan Workers' Party fighters, who Ankara says have taken up positions inside the Kurdish region in Iraq. These military preparations come after Turkish Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan recently said that he agreed with the army to carry out a possible military operation in northern Iraq. A new, yet old scenario is beginning to play out on the Iraqi-Turkish borders as the Turkish army once again beats the drums of war, possibly committing border violations like it did in the 1980s while pursuing members of the Kurdistan Workers' Party. In the past, Ankara would threaten to use force against them, even if this troubled and concerned Washington, its strategic ally. Speculation about an imminent attack increased after the Turkish Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan stated last week that he and the army agreed on launching a possible military operation despite concern from the United States. Kurdish Iraqi officials in the Kurdish region of Iraq did not remain silent in light of these statements by Turkish officials. Rather, they rushed to warn Turkey against the outcome of interfering in their affairs and threatened to interfere in Turkey's affairs. If I allow myself to interfere in the matter of Kirkuk, then we will also interfere in other issues, including Diyar Bekr and other cities. Turkish military preparations came amidst increased internal pressure on Erdogan's government to take action after a recent suicide bombing in Ankara that killed and wounded many civilians. The government blamed the Kurdistan Workers' Party for the operation. The military preparations also come after six Turkish soldiers were killed by a landmine that was planted underneath their military vehicle by separatist fighters. Observers say that a possible attack by Ankara on the Kurdish region in Iraq may increase tensions in its relations with Washington. More than 20 years ago, Turkey made incursions into Iraqi lands with Washington's approval, but Washington may not agree to such action today. Recently, two United States warplanes violated Turkish airspace near the Iraqi borders in an incident that American diplomats explained as a mere accident. However, the Turks believe it was a warning message to them. The Lebanese are waiting anxiously as the UN Security Council prepares to vote on a draft resolution to set up an international tribunal for the assassination of former Lebanese Prime Minister Rafiq al-Hariri. The Lebanese, including the opposition and government officials, expressed mixed reactions over holding the tribunal under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. Amidst hope and fear, the Lebanese are anxiously waiting to see what the next few days may bring. While some hope that the International Tribunal may bring stability to Lebanon, others believe that creating the court under Chapter 7 may worsen the political and security situation in the country. We are about to create a new turmoil in the country. I do not agree with the creation of an international tribunal under Chapter 7. I support the creation of an international court under Chapter 7 for a better and stronger Lebanon. I support it because it serves the interests of the Republic of Lebanon. It will also help clean up the country from all elements that have contributed to its instability.
The Lebanese are concerned about the current security and political crisis in the country. Meanwhile, the Lebanese authority tried to reassure its citizens by indicating that the exit to Lebanon's crisis starts at the doors of the International Tribunal. The Lebanese government believes that an international tribunal, which will prosecute the killers of Rafiq al-Hariri, may help put an end to the wave of assassinations and bomb attacks witnessed in the country. No one will be able to bring back Rafiq al-Hariri. However, this court may help return security, peace, freedom, sovereignty, and independence. With this, we will not live in terror and fear, and we do not have to worry about a new wave of assassinations. The Lebanese opposition accused the government of abusing its national sovereignty because it called for the creation of an international tribunal under Chapter 7 and outside Lebanese judicial institutions. According to the opposition, the Lebanese government lacks the legitimacy and is responsible for any consequences. The international tribunal will create an awkward position for the Lebanese. It will also put Lebanon's sovereignty at stake as the court will be in charge of making decisions on behalf of the Lebanese people. The objectives of those who support the international tribunal have become known to everyone. They want to provide peace and security to Israel. Meanwhile, the Lebanese continue to live in chaos. لم ينتهي الجدل حول المحكمة إذا، لكنه تحول هذه المرة من نقاش حول كيفية إقرارها. The debate over the international tribunal has not yet ended, but the discussion went from the creation of the court to its implementation and the impact it may have on the political and security situation. It seems that the Lebanese have entered another political cycle as the UN Security Council moves closer to vote on the Hariri Tribunal. Some believe that closing the files of this case at the Security Council will open a new door to chaos in Lebanon. In an exclusive interview, Mahmoud Abbas also said that Palestinians had to defend the unity government or face devastating consequences. I'm Sahil Rahman. And I'm Barbara Serra. You're watching Al Jazeera live from Doha. Also on the program, two years after the murder of Lebanon's former prime minister, the UN is to vote on a tribunal to investigate the killing. Plus, Thailand's oldest political party is cleared of breaking election laws, but the fate of its former ruling party still hangs in the balance. And the political movement, religious cult or criminal gang, who are Kenya's Mungiki? Welcome to Al Jazeera. The Palestinian president has said the Mecca agreement must be upheld and the Palestinian unity government defended, or there'll be disaster. Speaking exclusively to Al Jazeera's Nur Ode, Mahmoud Abbas pledged to work with Ehud Olmert for as long as he remained Israel's prime minister. The two leaders will meet next week for talks against a backdrop of Israeli airstrikes and Palestinian rocket attacks. Here's our Gaza correspondent, Nur Ode. In his presidential compound in Gaza, President Mahmoud Abbas sat down with Al Jazeera for an exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview. I started by asking him whether the Mecca agreement needed revisiting since the unity government was still under siege and Gaza has been gripped once again by factional violence. Uh, we must uphold the Mecca agreement as it did not come into existence from the void. It was preceded by many proposals and initial understandings, in addition to many endeavors exerted in Damascus, Doha, Egypt, and many other Arab capitals. Regarding Lebanon, President Abbas was adamant in opposing Fatah al-Islam, a group that has engaged the Lebanese army in fierce confrontations for a week now, with the residents of Nahr al-Barid camp paying a heavy price. Fatah al-Islam, first of all, is not a Fatah al-Islam is not Palestinian. It's not a Palestinian movement. And therefore, we, as the PLO and its leadership, everyone has announced that we are not connected to these people. The U.S. administration and some Palestinian players were not happy with the national unity government the president maintained. But what were the alternatives? We must defend and support this government. Otherwise, the consequence will be devastation, disasters, and grave repercussions. Mr. Abbas shrugged off the idea that meeting with the embattled Israeli Prime Minister was pointless, as even some in his Fatah party had suggested. 
أنا بهمني أن هذا الرجل اسمه رئيس وزراء إسرائيل المنتخب. What matters to me is that this man is the elected Israeli Prime Minister till today. I don't know what will happen tomorrow, but as long as he is the Israeli Prime Minister, I will have to deal with him on all issues. He spoke at length about the Arab Peace Initiative, which President Abbas considered the most important peace initiative in decades. I believe that the Israelis are missing the greatest opportunity in their history. When the Arab Peace Initiative was launched back in 2002, 70% of the Israelis accepted it. The president had not lost any of his candor. He maintained his position against Palestinian factions firing rockets into Israel. But he also saw in Israel's aerial campaign against Gaza and the arrest of elected parliamentarians a threat against the Palestinian Authority as a whole. Maybe Israel is working to topple the Palestinian Authority and create a complete political vacuum instead. The president discussed several other issues, including the kidnapping of Israeli Corporal Gilad Shalit and BBC correspondent Alan Johnston. This rare sit-down interview has come at a time when Palestinians are facing the most aggressive Israeli military campaign in months while trying to keep their national unity government afloat. Nuraudi Al Jazeera, Gaza. Well, dozens of people have turned out for the funerals of three Palestinians killed by Israeli forces in Gaza and the West Bank. Guns were fired into the air as the body of 24-year-old Mohammed Morai was paraded through the streets of Jenin. He was killed in overnight fighting with Israeli troops. Meanwhile, in Gaza, the funerals for two Hamas members were held. They were killed in an Israeli airstrike on a group firing rockets across the border. Baghdad and London are racing against time to find the five British nationals who were kidnapped yesterday from one of the Interior Ministry's buildings. No group has claimed responsibility for the operation, but Iraqi Foreign Minister Husher Zubiri said it is unlikely that Al-Qaeda-affiliated groups are behind it. He added that the kidnapping took place near an area under the control of al Mahdi army. We leave you with Katya Jamil. Katya Jamil. People are searching left and right on Palestine Street. It has been more than 24 hours since the five British nationals were kidnapped from here in a swift and well-planned operation that took only 10 minutes. Four land cruisers and other police vehicles raided the building. They only took 10 minutes. They did not stay long. Investigators are looking for evidence in the Al Sabah neighborhood, which is only a few kilometers away from the site of the kidnapping. A joint Iraqi and American force raided the neighborhood in the morning and launched a search operation during which some of the population were interrogated. They blindfolded our eyes and told us that we have to come up with the kidnapped British. Where are we going to bring them from? The search operation ended in the early morning. When the Iraqi and American soldiers left, it became possible to survey the results of their operation. Two people were killed and four others were injured in addition to this destruction. Iraqis want security badly, but they are confronted with violence. These kind of operations have become common in this area, but they do not help ease people's fears. The kidnapping of the four British nationals is clear evidence that the government has failed to provide security to the people in the streets. Iraqis want security badly, but they are confronted with violence. Thirty bodies with gunshot wounds were found in different areas in Baghdad, not to mention at least ten people were injured in separate attacks in western and southern Iraq. Hariri said that this was a dirty rumor tailored by Bashar al-Assad and Asif Shaukat. Fighting between the Lebanese army and Islamist militants flared again as their deadly standoff entered its 11th day on Wednesday and relief workers tried to get aid to stranded civilians. A political solution to the latest crisis that does not seem to be anywhere in sight. Last night, like every night in the past 11 days, gun battles erupted between the Lebanese army and Fatah al-Islam, holed up in the Nahr al-Barid camp. 
It was the most violent flare-up since the ceasefire one week ago and lasted until the early hours of the morning. There were no immediate reports of casualties. Yesterday, one Lebanese soldier was killed at dawn during a firefight with the militants. His death raises to 79 the number of killed since the violence began on May 20th. 34 of the dead are said to be soldiers. Sporadic fighting has erupted almost daily at the impoverished northern Shati town near the Mediterranean coast, although the fierce gun battles of the early days of the standoff have subsided amid efforts to mediate a peaceful solution. Fatal Islam spokesman Abu Salim Taha said the group was refusing to surrender any of its militants despite demands of the Lebanese government, which has vowed to crush the terrorist phenomenon. Meanwhile, the International Committee of the Red Cross continued to deliver supplies to those stranded in the camp without electricity and dwindling supplies. Trucks piled with water and food were waiting to enter the camp. ICRC officials said eight trucks had on Tuesday delivered food, water and candles. According to UN estimates, between 3,000 and 8,000 of the 31,000 Palestinian refugees registered at Nahr al-Barid are still inside the camp, while Prime Minister Fouad Sanyura said on Sunday that 5,000 remained. The UN Children's Agency, UNICEF, has called on all sides to protect trapped civilians, including children, it said had been through, quote, unspeakable trauma. Future television's correspondent at the Nahr al barid camp reported that during the clashes today, three members of Fatah al-Islam were killed and six others were injured. In a show of solidarity with the residents of Nahr al barid a massive demonstration took place in al Badawi refugee camp, where the protesters urged all sides to remain committed to the ceasefire agreement. The displaced residents from Nahr al barid refugee camp staged a massive protest in Badawi. The protesters called on the government to resolve the refugees' problem and secure their safe return. Meanwhile, the refugees confirmed that they will not accept any place but Nahr al barid as their place of residence. While some refugees agreed that Fatah al-Islam must be dealt with, others criticized the government and chanted slogans against Lebanese officials. Sheikh Walid Abu Hait, a member of the Palestinian Islamic Institute in Nahr al barid called for restraint and urged the refugees to resolve their problems through political means. They must allow all refugees to return to their homes. However, the process must be done in a way that protects the lives of our children. The return of the refugees is manipulated by the political and security situation. We support the right of return for all refugees, and we will not accept any place but Nahar al barid as our place of residence. As you know, tension has been running high in Nahar al barid and we demand an end to the bloodshed. We hereby ask the Lebanese officials to move quickly and secure a resolution that prevents the killing of our children, stop the humanitarian crisis, and allow the refugees to return. Several local and international humanitarian organizations held a sit-in near the south entrance of Nahr al barid The protesters held banners in Arabic and foreign languages demanding support for the Lebanese army and the refugee camp. In another development, Lebanese security officers engaged in a hot pursuit of a Honda in Beirut. The Lebanese security forces opened fire on a gray Honda Accord, killing a pregnant woman, and arrested the driver. According to police reports, the driver failed to stop at a security checkpoint near Hotel Do in central Beirut. After the driver ignored repeated warnings to stop, the officers opened fire on the car, seriously injuring a female passenger who later died at a local hospital. After his car was hit, the driver fled the scene but was later found and arrested by a a local police unit near the intersection of Shia Raudat Shahedin in Baabida. The police released the identity of the victim as 19-year-old Shadiel Fatouh. Fatouh, who was pregnant, was transported to the Sahel Hospital, where she later died of multiple gun wounds. The driver, who was later identified as 23-year-old Ibrahim Shawish, and the husband of Shadiel Fatouh, was arrested by police. Shawish has a long criminal record, where he was named a suspect in other unreleased related cases, which include murders, armed robberies, and possession of weapons. The investigation also confirmed that Shawish had stolen the car in the past few days from a car dealership in Burj al Barajna.
London announced support for the American decision to impose new sanctions on Sudan, while British officials are saying that what is happening in Darfur is unacceptable. However, Paris said that it was open to discussing these sanctions. U.S. President George Bush had asked Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice to discuss with Britain and other allies the possibility of a resolution calling for new sanctions on Sudan. Thus far, China is the only Security Council member opposing such resolution due to its oil interests in Sudan. في ظل مؤشرات تشير لاقتراب الموقفين السوداني والأممي من نقطة مشتركة لتصورهما As the gap between the Sudanese and the United Nations positions on the deployment of the United Nations peacekeeping forces in Darfur was narrowing, United States President George Bush had decided to impose new sanctions on Khartoum for what he called the failure of the Sudanese government to respond to the United Nations resolutions calling for the deployment of a large number of effective international forces in the region. This new escalation in the political struggle between Khartoum and Washington came as many political observers had thought that the crisis in Darfur was about to be resolved. In Friday's meeting between the Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir and United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, the two leaders agreed on the heavy support package. The agreement calls on the United Nations to provide logistical and technical support to the African Union forces in Darfur. Khartoum undermined Bush's decision, saying that it shows that the United States wants to politicize the Darfur issue. Uh, the U.S. did all that it could to impose economic sanctions on Sudan. It also used all its political power to act unilaterally against Sudan, like it did to other countries. The U.S. has isolated itself and its companies. Bush's decision shows that he is under strong pressure to bypass the Khartoum agreement between the United Nations and Sudan. Bush's decision also puts pressure on the United Nations to renege on the agreement and bypass it. One should keep in mind that Bush made his decision only a few days after a meeting had occurred between the Sudanese government, the African Union and the United Nations in Addis Ababa, at which ways to implement the heavy support package agreement had been discussed. أبرزت نواياها في أنا لا تريد الاستقرار وأنه حتى عندما يكون هناك I think that the U.S. has shown its true intentions. It does not want stability for the region. Whenever Sudan reaches peaceful agreements through the support of the U.N. and the African Union, the U.S. takes a contradictory position as if it does not want peace to take hold in Darfur. Political observers believe that the American decision to impose sanctions shows that the American-Sudanese relations are tense and that some lobby groups are behind this tension. Bush's decision, however, coincided with a visit by African-American investors to Khartoum in an attempt to counter Washington's lobby groups. Sanctions hurt people. Why should the U.S. government impose sanctions if it cares about the suffering of the people in Darfur? For Al Madar program, Osama Abbas, Abu Dubai Television, Al Khartoum. Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad paid a visit Wednesday to an exhibition on manifestation of self-reliance and defensive might of Iranian Defense Ministry in Tehran. Accompanied by cabinet ministers, the president visited several sections of the exhibition which put on display the latest achievements of Iranian armed forces, among them electronic, air, armor and defensive weapons and equipment. On the sidelines of the exhibition, President Ahmadinejad said Iranian armed forces with reliance on domestic equipment are well prepared to defend the country's territorial integrity. Following the remarks by the president, Iranian Defense Minister Mustafa Mohammad Najjar briefed the participants on Iran's progress in the defense sector. 
Iran's top nuclear negotiator Ali Larijani arrived in Madrid, Spain hours ago for talks with EU foreign policy chief Javier Solana on Thursday. Prior to his departure, Larijani rejected Wednesday suspension of uranium enrichment, terming it an unprincipled offer. Speaking to reporters, Larijani said, quote, suspension will not be a proper solution to ongoing standoff over Iran's peaceful nuclear case. As former UN weapons inspector chief Hans Blix has said, if Iran is supposed to suspend its nuclear activities, there would remain no topics for talks. He added that, quote, positive points were discussed in Ankara, describing them as buds which need to grow on an international level to resolve the issue. The talks will be the second round of negotiations. Iran and Pakistan and India have reached yet another agreement on 11 more issues concerning the peace gas pipeline deal. Iran's representative to the talks, Hojatullah Ghani Mifad, said Wednesday that the draft of the agreement deal is to be prepared in two weeks and would be offered to the governments of the three countries for final approval. Ghani Mifad added that three countries would push forward with the talks once India settles gas transfer issue with Pakistan. U.S. military has not allowed the families of the kidnapped Iranian diplomats to visit their loved ones. Iran's acting charge of affairs in Erbil, Hossein Zul Anwar, made the remark on Wednesday, adding Tehran has coordinated the issue with Iraqi officials and the International Committee of the Red Cross since two weeks ago. However, as he noted, the American officials have not made good on their pledges to that effect. This evening, the brother leader of the revolution, Muammar Gaddafi, welcomed the British Prime Minister, Tony Blair. At the beginning of his meeting, Blair expressed his pleasure and honor in meeting the brother leader for the second time in the Great Republic of Libya. During this meeting, the British Prime Minister praised the brother leader for his role in strengthening peace and guaranteeing stability globally, as well as his clear strategic and analytical vision about many world affairs and issues, especially those related to the environment and to poverty. Blair also expressed his great appreciation for the brother leader's efforts in establishing the African Union and its advancements, which now occupy a prestigious role in the world among other organizations. During his meeting, Tony Blair informed the brother leader that after he ends his term as British Prime Minister, he will spend time on humanitarian issues throughout the world, especially in Africa. He added that he will continue contact with the brother leader for his guidance, advice, and strategic analysis of these issues. Blair confirmed that he will exert continued effort in the international arena in order to support the economy and the development in Africa. Blair clarified that he will speak at the 8th AU summit to be held next week on the need for strengthening cooperation between Europe and Africa, supporting the African Union, and assisting its efforts to achieve the aspirations of the African continent. During this meeting, the brother leader expressed the appreciation of the Great Republic of Libya for the British Prime Minister's efforts to find ways of strengthening cooperation and developing bilateral relations between the two countries. Many issues of mutual concern were discussed during this meeting, including the spread of peace and stability in the world and the utilization of international capabilities for the service of humanitarian issues that relate to peace, health, education, and the combating of poverty around the world. The brother leader and the British Prime Minister discussed Europe and its plans for the future as well. Attending the meeting were Secretary of General People's Committee, Secretary for the People's Committee on Foreign Liaison and International Cooperation, the Assistant Secretary and Secretary of European Affairs in the Committee, as well as the advisor to the British Prime Minister and the British Ambassador to the Great Republic of Libya. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. 
please visit linktv.org backslash mosaic for more information about these broadcasters or to view previous mosaic programs, obtain program transcripts, or receive the weekly Mosaic Intelligence Report. Mosaic is made possible by a grant from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Additional support is provided by the Firedall Foundation, the Otto Haas Charitable Trust, and by committed Link TV viewers like you. This program was brought to you by Link TV for educational and non commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. television network devoted to global and national news with uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs programs which connect you to the world.